Thank you very much. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will, I will tell you a bit about the uh, about the onset of uh, uh, the time when Hess uh, investigated cosmic rays and uh, just about uh, uh, some people influencing uh, his uh, attitude to uh, physics and, and also to the research he has done. Uh, there are some connections with uh, uh, very important people like Franz Erwin Exner, who will explain in a minute uh, about his life and about his work. Um, I'm starting then with radioactivity, which is connected to, uh, to Hess in the sense that he was working at an institute for radium research, so uh, actually the physics of of uh, radio, radium. Um, there I want to talk about Stefan Meyer a bit. Uh, then I will come to the point of atmospheric electricity, where Victor Franz Hess is uh, uh, somehow a follower of the um, of different uh, people working in the Institute of uh, Franz Herf and Exner. Uh, just to name a few, uh, this is would be Hans Bendorf and Egon von Schreiber. And then I will come, uh, at the end I will come uh, a bit back to Victor Franz Hess and uh, just give you some hints uh, from the literature uh, what we probably have not completely known or what we probably don't really understand. And at the end I will come again to atmospheric electricity like in my title, atmospheric electricity is in in the last place, it should be, or it could be also in the, in the second place, so the, the type could be from radioactivity via uh, atmospheric electricity to cosmic rays. I, ch uh, I choose uh, ra from radioactivity to uh, via uh, cosmic rays to atmospheric electricity, and this has a little bit to do with my background, um, because I'm doing uh, research in, in uh, space-related subjects, and uh, this atmospheric electricity has changed during uh, the course of time and uh, some, uh, some problems we are actually working on in uh, space research today. Um, I want to tell you a bit about Franz Serafin Exner. Franz Serafin Exner uh, grew up in Vienna, um, studied, I mean he grew up in a family uh, which uh, or in a family where several, several members of the family uh, had a background in university teaching. Uh, his father, I think his father was uh, influential in changing the Austrian university system uh, in, in the years around 1870. Um, he himself studied uh, physics at the University of Vienna uh, and then uh, he also was one year uh, at the University of Zurich but he returned, to, he returned to the University of, uh, of Vienna to graduate uh, in the year 1871. Graduation in this sense means he got his PhD, uh, nowadays PhD, doctorate in, in, in Austrian terms, uh, at this time. Uh, nowadays we have, we have a much more complicated system with different grades. You have the first to get before you can uh, even, even touch to, uh, to get a PhD. Uh, he then left Vienna for several year, for two years uh, to work at the University of Strasbourg, at a newly established uh, university, but he returned in 1874 and made his, uh, his habilitation, so his, uh, he was a docent and he was, uh, he was able to, to teach physics on his own uh, at the University of Vienna and he was actually assistant to Victor uh, von Lang. Uh, an experimental physicist who was, uh, before he went to Vienna, he was professor at the uh, University of Graz as well. And this was at the Physical Institute. I'm using the term Physical Institute uh, here. Uh, in general, it's a little bit more complicated because the story of this Physical Institute is, to, is somehow interconnected with the Chemical Institute. So sometimes this institute was uh, even a Physical Chemical Institute, then it split it again into one physical institute and then suddenly appeared the second physical institute and it was joined again, so it's a, it's a story by its own. Um, but it's not the topic of my talk here. Um, in 1879 he was named extraordinary professor at the University of Vienna and in, 18, uh, in 1891 
He was then named full professor at the Physical Chemical. He is, was at, uh, at this time it was the Physical Chemical Institute of the University of Vienna. And he was uh, the successor to uh, Joseph Loschi, yeah. um, who we can see downstairs in, in, in the Hall of Fame of the, uh, of the Physical Museum. Um, later on, he was then named director of the Institute for Radio Research, but to this point, I come uh, a bit later. He, he retired then in 1920, but you can see that uh, when he was full professor, so he was full professor for almost 30 years, and so he, he really influenced the, uh, the physics done at this physical, uh, physical chemical institute. Uh, and uh, I just want to show you uh, two pictures. Uh, the upper one, uh, the lower one, showing uh, the group of physicists, uh, even having some names uh, to it, uh, which uh, were incorporated into this uh, into the system. And you can find names like Schweidler, Krishnan, uh, we, we heard yesterday, Ehrenhaft, Felix Ehrenhaft uh, was also working at this, uh, Mache was very famous. Uh, then Felix Exner uh, is a relative of uh, Franz Seraphine Exner, but he was a meteorologist. Um, you can also see in the front row Paul Bausch, uh, Lang himself, and uh, yeah, different other, uh, other physicists, Stamper, for example. And also on the right hand, uh, sitting in the, on the right, uh, on the most right, uh, this is Stefan Meyer. Uh, in the other picture, <coughs> I don't know why in the, in the lower picture uh, Franz Seraphim Exner is not on the picture, so I was a little bit surprised, but probably he was just uh, off, off the institute at the time. Um, but on the other picture you can see him uh, in the middle uh, staying, and uh, in front of him was uh, Stefan Meyer, an assistant uh, to, uh, uh, to Franz Seraphim Exner. And to Stefan Meyer, I'm coming in the next slide. Um, Stefan Meyer was born in Vienna and he studied at the University, at the University of Vienna Physics uh, and for one year he was then uh, in Leipzig, made his graduation at the University of Vienna and in brackets you can see F F S uh, FSE, which is Franz Seraphine Exner. So he made his uh, PhD thesis with Exner already in the year 1896, uh, but then he, he left Exner's Institute, and he was assistant to Ludwig Boltzmann at the Theoretical Physics Institute. And he was assistant to, uh, to uh, Boltzmann uh, till uh, the death of Boltzmann in 1906. And then, uh, after, after this, uh, after making his reputation in 1900, uh, he was then uh, taking assistantship at Franz Serf in Exner's Institute. So he didn't he didn't work in the theoretical institute anymore, but he changed to the experimental, uh, to experimental physics. And now we have two dates, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the date nine, uh, 1908 and 1911, and with both of them is connected uh, the so-called extraordinary professorship at the University of Vienna. And uh, the reason for this is, is very simple. The Austrian system at this time uh, was the following. You could be named uh, extraordinary professor, this was just a title, uh, but uh, on the other hand there was a second possibility that, uh, that you got a kind of professorship. And this was not only the name. So that, that's why you can see that first you just got the name uh, extraordinary professor and then uh, there was uh, some kind of more duties probably uh, of teaching was involved with, uh, with, the, second, uh, with the second name. So, in the year 1910, he was then named, not officially, executive, executive director of the Institute for Radium Research. I will come to this a little bit later in the next biograph when I talk about the Radium Research Institute. So, officially, the director was Franz Seraphine Exner. He was also the head of the Physical Institute. Officially, the director was Franz Seraphine Exner, but in reality, uh, Stefan Meyer was uh, taking the lead in the institute, and uh, he was then named. He was then named uh, full professor of physics in the year 1915, and uh, this, uh, uh, and he was then named Vorstand of the Physics Institute in 1920. 
uh, at the Physics Institute. In 1920, he was then officially uh, upgraded to director uh, when, when uh, Serotonin Exner retired. Uh, he was then named director of the Institute, Institute for Radium Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. At this time, it was already URV. URV stands for the Austrian Academy of Sciences. When the institute was uh, founded, uh, the academy's name was not Austrian Academy of Sciences, but Imperial Academy of Sciences Vienna. Uh, so it was uh, uh, just to distinguish between the different academies in the Austrian Hungarian Empire. Uh, Stefan Meyer actually uh, had to retire in 1938, uh, but he has, uh, how to put it, uh, just after the Anschluss, one week after the Anschluss, when uh, Austria. Uh, uh, was incorporated into the German Reich, or the Deutsches Reich. Um, he actually asked for early retirement uh, because he probably knew that uh, due to his Jewish origin uh, he would probably be expelled, what actually happened after some time. But he asked beforehand uh, to retire and he went out of Vienna and he uh, lived the, the next few years uh, in uh, Bad Ischl, it's in Upper Austria, and he, he lived his, uh, yeah, his life there very, uh, very silently and due to some friends in Bad Ischl and also his daughter, uh, he was never, uh, he was never uh, yeah, uh, uh, threatened by the, by, the Nazis, by the Nazis. And in the year 1945, he was then, uh, he, he again took uh, took his job at the, at the Physics Institute. Uh, he was named honorary professor because he was too old to be full professor. So uh, at this time he was already too old to be full professor. So uh, uh, they named him honorary professor. And in 1947 he retired, uh, dying two years later. Just to show you the setup. Uh, this is a picture of Stefan Meyer in the year 1912 uh, in the Radium Institute. This was the newly established Institute of the Academy of Sciences. And uh, the other picture on the right hand shows you uh, Stefan Meyer with Gustav Wagner in the year 1925, also in the, uh, in the Physics Institute. Mm -hmm. I will now jump a bit later to atmospheric electricity. Uh, you have heard a lot yesterday, you have heard a lot uh, about electri uh, atmospheric electricity uh, today, and I will just uh, show some new graphs here. Uh, already in 1750, Benjamin Franklin suspected that um, electric charge is carried by discrete particles, but he couldn't he couldn't prove this. Yeah? But uh, uh, there, there is some literature about that he suspected that the charge is transported by discrete particles. Uh, Charles Long. Uh, was actually working then in, in 1785 uh, along the, uh, the problem of electric <coughs> dispersion. And the speculation was that this dispersion takes place uh, due to aerosols in the air. Uh, the, the main problem with this, uh, so it took about 100 years uh, to, uh, to prove that this was not true. Uh, because in, in 1887, so 100 years later, about uh, it turned out that the electric dispersion is larger even during fair weather heat, so when there are no air sources. Yeah. And so this was a problem uh, which could not be really solved at the time. Uh, it was then in 1879 that uh, Joseph, Joseph Thompson confirmed uh, the existence of electrons, uh, he could, but he could not determine uh, the, the charge, neither the mass, but he could determine uh, the mass rate, uh, mass to charge rate, ratio, and for this he actually got the Nobel Prize in 1906. Uh, this is just to show you, uh, he, he used uh, such a device where you put an electric field on and additionally you put uh, then on the, on the right hand side, in the lower, lower border, uh, you put an additional an magnetic field and out of, out of this you can then actually get the uh, the mass to charge ratio. Um, coming a little bit closer to the times when uh, Dr. Franz Hess was working, uh, there was a the problem, as I told you, that the charge of the metal cylinder uh, will be lost with time, even if you have best isolation. And this, this was a problem nobody really could under, 
understand. Uh, and it was then uh, to measure this uh, uh, kind of uh, ionization of uh, uh, Theodor Wolf. Uh, we've seen this picture already uh, several times and made measurements of uh, the Eiffel Tower. I'm not going into this detail because you've seen this. But I just want to point out that it was Robert Milliken who was a uh, passionate experimenter. Uh, Robert Milliken will come again in my talk in a not so favorable position as uh, Mr. Walter uh, was telling today already. Uh, but in the beginning of his career, uh, he actually uh, thought about this uh, and found out this uh, so-called oil drop experiment. And for this oil drop experiment, he actually got the Nobel Prize in the year 1923. So that means in the year 1923, he was already a very respected person in American, in American physics. I'm not going to details how, how this works, but uh, I'm now going to two persons uh, who have done, or who are related to atmospheric electricity in Austria. Uh, one is uh, Hans Bendorf. Hans Bendorf was born in Zurich because his father was professor of archaeology, archaeology in Zurich. And uh, he studied at the University of Vienna, Heidelberg and Berlin. Um, he was then assistant to Franz Serafin Exner. So Serafin Exner uh, was really gathering a cloud of uh, interesting new uh, uh, young physicists around him at the Physical Institute in Vienna. So in 1893, he was, since 1893, he was a uh, He uh, got his PhD in two years later, and his habilitation in physics, uh, actually he got uh, with, an, uh, with a work on air electrical measurements in Tomsk, in Russia. Uh, and actually he got his habilitation uh, where he proved that, that his uh, uh, that his uh, supervisor, uh, that, his, that his supervisor's uh, theory was wrong. Uh, but Franz Serafin Exner uh, actually told that, that this is okay. I mean, if he could prove that he was wrong, uh, this was okay. And uh, yeah, so his name is inscribed into this uh, history of the of the of Austrian physics as the one who proved that, that his supervisor was wrong. Um, he was then working in 1904, so even after habilitation he was working uh, with Franz Serafin Exner at the Institute, and he was then named in 1904, he was then named Extraordinary Professor of Meteorology at the Physics Institute in, in Graz, and he went to Graz and, uh, and worked for the rest of his life, he worked in Graz. Um, he was later on named uh, in 1910 full professor of experimental physics and actually it was then uh, during the time of his full professorship where he was par parallel professor then also Victor Franz Hess was professor in Graz. Um, in 1936 he had to retire, uh, he was retired officially, uh, he didn't want to but he was forced to retire uh, because uh, he had some quarrel with the Austrian um, minister for education at this time there was no science and research this was a ministry for, uh, for education he was named then in the year 1911 extraordinary professor in, in Vienna first but then he got, he got a job as full professor of physics at the University of Innsbruck so uh, atmospheric electricity the, um, the field of atmospheric electricity uh, actually moved to Innsbruck and uh, when, when uh, Hess also moved uh, later on moved also the Innsbruck, so this was a, uh, a prolongation of atmospheric electricity uh, in Innsbruck. Um, uh, Egon Schweigler returned uh, as full professor of physics uh, to Vienna uh, because at, this, at, at that time a lot of people uh, took first full professorship somewhere else in the, in the province, we call it, yeah? and afterwards some of them were actually called back as professors to, to the main institute in Vienna. Um, uh, Egon Schreiber was also very instrumental in the Austrian Academy of Sciences because he was for long years uh, secretary, general secretary and even vice president of the, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. I, I just, just have seen outside, there's a very nice poster I think Mr. Walter was putting on where uh, 
some of the work of, uh, of Schreiber is actually mentioned. He also is the author of a book on atmospheric electricity. Now I'm coming to the real topic of my talk. And <laughs> Uh, the Institute for Radium Research in Vienna. Uh, it turned out that uh, uh, in the year 1908, uh, a private person, uh, here a private sponsor, Karl Kuppelwieser, uh, he gave money to the, to the Austrian Academy of Sciences uh, to establish an institute for doing research on the new element of radium. And it turned out that there was so much money that, they, that the Austrian Academy of Sciences could actually build an institute, could, could, could make a new building. Uh, so the, on the left hand side you can see the building. At this time there was no other building around. Nowadays this, uh, the institute is surrounded by, by the physics and, and the chemistry buildings. And there's a complex of buildings right now uh, where all the physics and, and chemistry is, is uh, located at the University of Vienna. But at the time, uh, when the building was built, it was the only building in this area. And uh, you can see on the right hand side, you can then see the building uh, of the Physical Institute, which, which is next to the, uh, to the Radium Institute. And as head uh, of this Radium Institute, uh, yeah, I have to tell you, the, the, the money was enough to build, the, the, to make the building and also to, uh, to to buy the, the first equipment. The first equipment can almost all the first equipment can be or is shown uh, can be seen downstairs in the museum. Uh, and uh, Franz Serafin Exner, the Austrian state just had to pay for the assistant and for the uh, uh, and for the yeah, for the professors. But Franz Serafin Exner was then actually named uh, additionally to his job as, as leader of the the Physics Institute, he was named head of the institute, but in reality, Stefan Meyer was the acting director of this radio institute. Mm. This is actually uh, a drawing of this, uh, of this building. You can see on the right hand side, you can see this, this smaller, uh, this small building here is the radio institute, which is now surrounded here by the chemistry institute, by the physical institute, and uh, some and some other buildings of the uh, University of Vienna. Uh, I just want to tell that uh, this institute uh, was living for a long time, uh, this Radium Institute, but uh, due to uh, changes in the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the institute actually split it uh, after, uh, I think in the 70s, split it into two different institutes, one of the institute is now named, it was long named uh, Institute for Middle Energy Physics. Now it's named uh, after, even after Stefan Meyer, so it's now named uh, Stefan Meyer Institute for Subatomic Physics of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, and the other institute, or the other part of the Radium Research Institute, I think, was integrated into the University of Vienna, uh, uh, into the Institute of Isotope Research and Nuclear Physics, and the next speaker. Is head, uh, was head of this institute that we can probably tell more about the details why an institute split it into Academy of Sciences Institute and, and, uh, and uh, Institute of the University. I don't want to go into these details. Uh, I just want to tell that uh, to my understanding the research done in the Radium Research Institute uh, had also two follow-up institutions in the Austrian Academy of Sciences because part of this, uh, of this research uh, originally started in the Radium Research Institute uh, is now also done in the Institute for High Energy Physics at the, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences where we also have the director, uh, Professor Fabian, in the room. Uh, and he can explain you when, you, when you go downstairs to see the museum, he can explain you the chamber. Uh, to see, to really see the cosmic rays, you can probably explain about the work uh, the High Energy Physics Institute is doing. And to my understanding, at least for some subjects uh, which uh, came out of this Radium Research Institute, also the institute where I am working right now is the Space Research Institute located in, in Graz, is to some degree a follow-up uh, of this Radium Research Institute. So just let me... But just let me uh, finish my talk with two, remark, two or three remarks concerning Victor Franz Hess. Actually, this is uh, uh, the 
parish re register of, uh, of the archive of the diocese in Graz. So actually you can see here, uh, he was born on the 24th uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he was baptized on the 25th, 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. He was born on, at Schloss Waldstein, uh, which is the number 27. So if you look up uh, Waldstein 27, you can find this even today in, the, in, in Google. Um, and you can also see his name uh, is Victor with C at this time. Uh, the, the, the German language changed, uh, changed C to K after some time. For example, you, you can see that several Karls, uh, born in the 19th century, uh, originally uh, have written their name with C, Karl, but now they are, they are written with K. And the same happened with Victor Franz Hess. So he was born as a Victor with, with C. And the other names have been Franz, Seraphine. Seraphine is, uh, Seraphine is the second word here, and this is, uh, he is named uh, after his mother because his mother was Serafina on the upper right hand side you can see his mother is Serafina, geborene Edle von Großbauer Waldstedt and left is Vincent Johann Hess. Uh, this is also uh, some, uh, some problem with the German language uh, because we have we changed our writing and you can see Hess in his case is written in, with two S. Uh, one would actually uh, transcribe this with a sharpest S, uh, but uh, Hess himself used different forms of his name, uh, probably also due to his stays in the United States, he then actually settled with double S. Uh, so this is, if you have some time tomorrow, maybe in the morning hours, or if you don't, uh, this is actually uh, the Google picture of the, the Castle Wallstein where he was born. And this is actually not very, this is not very far from Pöllau, so it's about 75 km, kilometers from Pöllau to Waldstein in Deutsch Feistritz. So if you have some time, just take, uh, take your car and, uh, and have a look at this Schloss Waldstein. And my, yeah, and my, my last two slides, uh, I just want to tell you uh, at, an, as a, at the 50th anniversary of no, the 40th anniversary of the Radium uh, Research Institute uh, has wrote a small article about his time uh, in the institute and he actually named this time the, uh, the 10 years of the Radium Institute have been, as I confess today, 30 years later, so it was 30 years, the, fi uh, the finest years of my life. Additionally, I just want to make a short comment uh, on the first two balloons as a set of, uh, of uh, Victor Franz Hess, because in a, in a paper he wrote, not in the Physikalische Zeitschrift, but in a, um, in a, in a short note uh, on, uh, yeah, for, the, for the organization who supported his balloon flights, uh, he actually uh, wrote the following sentence in November 1911. One could think that the cosmic gamma radiation may be coming from the sun, penetrates the atmosphere, an opinion which I, however, do not consider as very probable. So actually in November 1911, he was in, in these two balloon flights, so that he made measurements up to 1,300 uh, 1, 1, meters. In his first publication, he actually told that he does not consider this uh, radiation coming from an external source. Uh, one year later, and this is borrowed from, borrowed from uh, Professor Bauer's talk, uh, he got grants from the Open Academy of Sciences to make these additional balloon slides, and then, he said, and then he said that the results of the present observation seem to be most readily, uh, readily explained by the assumption that the radiation of very high penetration power enters our atmosphere from above and still produces in the lowest layer a part of the ionization observed in, in the closed vessel. So he changed his mind within half a year. Um, actually, for, for this slide, even before he got his Nobel Prize, he, he was named, uh, he was given the highest uh, prize at the time of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So in 1919, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, uh, he won the, the Lean Prize for for his research.